This is SAT vocabulary list number 19. So as I'm going through the words, please write the words, the part of speech, and the definition in your Cornell style notes. And then make any comments in the side, any note any examples I say that help you to remember the word. Or if I say something that triggers an idea for you, jot that down so hopefully you'll remember this list. The first word is acquaint which is a verb, and it means to make familiar. So when you acquaint yourself with something, maybe you spend some time with it. If it's a subject or a topic, then you're learning about it. Maybe you're reading about it. If you are trying to acquaint yourself with another person, you're probably meeting them, having conversations. You're trying to become familiar with either the topic or the person. And the noun form of this word, acquaintance, actually is kind of synonymous with someone you know who's kind of a, a friend, but maybe not a friend you know really well. They're an acquaintance. Someone you know, if you saw them in the street, you would say hi, um, but not someone you know a ton about. So an example picture would just be people shaking hands. This is kind of the signal of meeting someone, getting to know them, maybe striking up the beginning of some kind of relationship or friendship. The second word is apparent. And a parent describes something that is very easily understood. Um, it's visible, it's kind of clear, and to me, whenever I hear the word apparent, it sounds a little bit, or reminds me a little bit of the word appear, apparent, appear, and so that might help you remember that this is something that's visible, easily seen, easily understood. So if you were outside of this body of water, this enormous sign would make it apparent that you should not swim in this water. If you didn't already think it looked a little murky or unsafe, this sign is there to make it apparent that no one is to swim in this water. Conscience, this is a tricky word to spell. So you might just want to make a note in kind of your head that you spell it con science. Even though it's conscience, con science is how it's spelled. And this is, and this is an SAT dictionary or vocabulary definition, so it's a little bit more complicated than maybe it needs to be. But your conscience is, it's a noun, and it is the faculty in which, um, the faculty in man which basically lets him or her distinguish between what is right and what is wrong. Um, and particularly when we're talking about character, your behavior, your conduct. So really our conscience helps us to dictate how we behave in society, when we engage with other people. It's what helps us to make quote unquote, the right choice when given a decision. Um, and so a lot of times we'll think of kind of somebody considering something and on one shoulder you have the angel telling them to do something good and follow their conscience. And on the other shoulder you have like this kind of devil figure trying to talk you into doing something that you really know that you probably shouldn't do. Four is empower. And two, this is a verb, and the definition here says to delegate authority to. And to get delegate authority to basically means to give someone else authority, to give someone else power. So whenever you give someone else power that maybe you had or somebody else had previously, you give them the authority to make decisions, um, you are empowering them. So in my own classroom, part of the reason I want students to use mobile devices, cell phones, iPads, whatever they have, is I really want to empower you. I want to give you the power to drive your own learning. So you can look things up, you can problem solve, you can collaborate more easily. Whereas if I was a traditional, kind of in the role of a traditional teacher, I would want all of the power. I would want to have all the answers, but I don't want all the answers. I want you as students to be empowered to problem solve, think critically, and drive what happens in the classroom. Number five is gratification. And this is a noun, and it means satisfaction. The verb form is to gratify, which means to satisfy. And a lot of times when we experience gratification or we experience satisfaction, uh, if we're satisfied by something, um, it means whatever we've just done 
has usually given us some kind of great pleasure. And so gratification can be a good thing. But when you're a young child, oftentimes kids don't understand delayed gratification. And when you delay gratification, you put it off. So instead of as a child would, maybe jamming an entire chocolate cake in your mouth and immediately satisfying your desire to eat, you might delay gratification. You might push off that moment um, to enjoy a cake maybe until after you've had a really great workout, or maybe you just enjoy that cake on your birthday, um, or you just say no to cake because you don't, you know, you don't want the calories or whatever the situation. But adults are more able to delay gratification, kind of delay satisfying their own desires um, for maybe somebody else's good or for their own good. So just think of gratification as, you know, satisfaction, or to gratify as to satisfy, um, and then think of this whole idea of delayed gratification. Six is innovate, and there's lots of different forms of this word that we talk about or that we have kind of throw around in class, right? Innovation, innovator. To innovate is the verb form, and it means to introduce or to strive for or to work towards introducing new things. Innovation is the actual noun, right? What's produced or created that's new. And an innovator is a person who is very innovative, who innovates, right? So a lot of people might think of someone like Steve Jobs from Apple as being um, an innovator, someone who innovates, right? Constantly trying to strive to create new things, introduce new things. Someone would also, you know, can make an argument about Albert Einstein. Many of the great thinkers in history really did innovate. They created new things, uh, introduced them to society. Seven is linguistics. And linguistics is the science of languages. Um, Oftentimes, it's the study of the origin, history, the significance or the importance of languages. And I'll never forget, I was at UCLA and I needed an extra class and I asked my mom, if you could go back to school, mom, what class would you take? And she said, I'd take linguistics. And I said, okay. So I signed up for a linguistics class and man, it was like the worst experience ever. I ended up in a class where what we studied was where your mouth or how your mouth creates sounds. So if you're saying the word p like uh, or please, you start with the letter p and that's a bilabial lips, two lips, bilabial push. That makes the p sound. And that was the entire class was just studying the sounds and how we create sounds with the actual movements of our mouth. So thinking about the study of languages, now clearly my experience was not representative of the entire study of linguistics, but linguistics is the study of language. And a linguist is someone who studies language or is extremely skilled in several languages. Number eight is nuance. Nuance is a noun, and it's a slight, very subtle, small degree of difference in anything perceptible. So anything we can see or feel or smell or taste, it's a subtle degree, a very slight, small degree of difference. And we're able to perceive that or kind of note it, the, this difference, which is the nuance. Um, and so this actually comes from a French word meaning the shade or hue, because oftentimes, like let's say you're painting your bedroom and your bedroom is blue. Well, there's lots of different shades of blue. There's even very subtle nuances and differences in the shades of different light blues. So you would never go to the store and just pick a paint assuming it's going to match your paint on your walls because there may be a very subtle nuances, differences in the shades of blue. Um, when you look at artwork from far away, a lot of times it's it's not as easy to see the really subtle nuances, the brush strokes, the coloring, the texture. And so if you look very closely at a piece of artwork, then you, you might be able to appreciate those nuances, the slight degrees of difference in terms of the, um, the meaning, the expression, um, anything that is perceptible. 
Nine is prevalent, and it describes anything that is widespread. So if it is widespread, it's common, it's prevalent. And so it describes anything that is wide of, they say, of wide extent. I would just say widespread. Or occurring, happening frequently. So it happens a lot. So anything that is widespread or happens a lot is prevalent. And I have feel like I have been sick for the entire month of October. Right now, it feels like the cold and flu season is on us, and colds are very prevalent. Lots of people are getting them. Lots of kids are out sick. One of my favorite things that is prevalent are the Starbucks. A lot of people maybe are not big fans of the Starbucks, but I love my coffee, and so I love that they're prevalent, that they're everywhere, and if I need a a cup of coffee, I can stop and get one. Um, They're even popping up all over Europe and other countries, so when I'm traveling, it's fun to be able to stop and get coffee that I know what it's going to taste like, I know what to expect. 10 is replica, and you'll hear um, not only the word replica, which is a noun, but replicate, to replicate is the verb form, and it's any close or exact copy of something or reproduction of something. So there are actual replicas of artwork that are so similar to the famous pieces that they copy that it takes someone who actually studies art to tell the difference. Um, A lot of times in novels, they'll talk about, you know, art being stolen and a replica putting in it, put in its place, um, and it's an exact copy or a very close copy that's put in its place. This is a wax figure, and wax figures attempt to make close or exact copies of people. So here we have President Obama in wax figure form, and this is a replica. Eleven is skepticism, and skepticism is a noun, and it is the entertainment of doubt. So if you're experiencing doubt, you are experiencing kind of skepticism about something. You'll also hear the word skeptical. Um, So if someone's kind of skeptical, again, they are doubting that something is correct or valid. So thinking about, um, you know, whenever you're unsure of something, you're, you would be described as skeptical, which is the adjective form. And so he does not look convinced. Whatever the conversation is, he clearly looks like he's kind of analyzing it. He's not sure about it. Um, when we talk about things like global warming, there are still people who are skeptical. They feel like it's not us causing the planet to get warmer, and maybe it's just a natural heating trend. Um, and so there are some people who experience skepticism when you talk about things like global warming. Surreptitious describes anything that is sneaky. It's kind of obtained or done by stealth or secret. And so I would think surreptitious, sneaky, very good synonyms to just kind of keep in mind. But anything that is done um, kind of secretly would be described this way. And so here's a, a, a series of pictures. It reminds me of like a movie where they're going to like hand off a briefcase or exchange some kind of information in a very um, surreptitious way. 13 is unbridled. And it describes someone or something that is without restraint. I usually think of um, people when I think of the word unbridled. But think about a bridle, right? You put a bridle on a horse around its head so that you can control the horse. And so a bridle would be restraint. It would help you restrain a horse from just doing whatever it wants to do. If someone is described or something's described as unbridled, like I have unbridled enthusiasm for something. It just means it's so over the top. I can't control how excited and enthusiastic I am. Some people have unbridled passions about certain things, which means they're so passionate about it, they can't possibly hold it in. But just to help you remember, I do have a picture of a horse with a bridle to just kind of keep this in mind, right? You put it on, you can control the horse. Without it, the horse does what it wants. It's totally um, kind of free will. It can do kind of run whatever direction it wants. 14 is inarticulate. Sometimes on my vocabulary videos, I feel a little inarticulate, right? It's someone who's inarticulate is, it describes something or someone who's kind of hard to understand, uh, incomprehensible, not able to be comprehended. 
um, either because uh, the way they're talking doesn't make sense or what they're saying isn't super clear. A lot of times in my when I'm reading student writing, I feel like the writing is a little inarticulate, right? It, it's not direct. It's not straight to the point. Sometimes the sentences are run on or the words that are used are a little unclear. And so inarticulate can describe some, like the way someone talks. So if it's hard to understand what they're saying, they might be described as inarticulate or what they're saying is, you know, unclear or even in writing. So anytime you're communicating and it's not clear, you might be described as inarticulate. And so I just have an example of a sentence that for me, it would be a little, a little wordy, inarticulate, not straight to the point, not, I can't really exactly understand what the writer is trying to express. And then the last word is clamor, and it's a noun, and it's a loud outcry, big sound, um, and this is not a good sound. It is a great expression of discontent. So if I said, okay, this weekend you're going to read the entire Lord of the Flies, there would be an outcry from my classes, like, Tucker, what are you talking about? Usually we take a few weeks to read a book. How can we possibly read it this weekend? So there would be a clamor. You guys would be angry. You'd be discontent. You'd want to express it, and you'd probably express it really verbally in this kind of loud outcry. There would be a clamor. And if you've ever spent any time with a small child, just tell them they can't have something that they want, and you will experience a clamor. You will hear it.